for your travelling and expedition, what would you say is the biggest challenge you face? When I started doing expeditions on leaving the army, um, I found that at that time in the 1970s, moving on into the 80s, um, was a period when a lot of people from different countries suddenly awoke to the fact that there were big world records like landing on the moon, mm. which hadn't yet been done. And because they all seemed to realize it in different countries, it was a rat race. It was highly competitive. And um, my wife, who did all the research, came up with the ideas of what we might manage to do before experts from other countries. Mm. The polar um, field, rather than the, who we first up, the south face of my Deborah's talk, whatever, polar thing was pretty simple because there's only two poles. Mm. Um, the North Pole, for 300 years, the Brits had been the people who really pioneered getting further and further north and they had had many more people killed, or Franklin's expedition lost 150 sailors. No one knew what happened to them, up in the ice there somewhere. But although the Brits had this great mortality rate and got further and further further, they didn't actually get the prize of reaching the North Pole first. That was claimed by the Americans in 1910. And that same year, 19, well, 1908, the Norwegian Amundsen had been planning to be first to the North Pole. So when he discovered, he got his ship ready, got everything ready, that the Americans got there first, he switched and went down to try first at the South Pole. Yeah. And when he did that, he didn't tell anybody. So the British attempt, because they also had led the way into Antarctica, they were the first ever to land under Captain Scott in Antarctica. And so what they were doing down there was scientific work, not racing. Mm. They wanted to get to the pole before anybody else, naturally, because they were down there, but they didn't know they had to do it quickly. Oh. They didn't take the world's expert ski racers, yeah. which the Norwegians did. They took a load of scientists, ah. because that was what they were after. Was it a continent? Was it floating ice? The Brits discovered all the scientific stuff and got the fossils out and so on but they didn't win the competitive race. Mm -hmm. So when we, 60 years later, nearly 60 years later, came onto the polar scene, meaning our group of volunteers, not all of whom were British, uh, but they were all sort of Commonwealth types from South Africa or Canada or you know, Ireland, Scotland, and so on and so forth. Our group came from nine different countries, and um, the person who planned it all was uh, my late wife, who was the base commander radio operator, probably the best Morse code radio operator around. And um, she'd been training with the Royal Signals, Territorials and the Merchant Navy and so on. And we found that the Norwegians were desperately trying to be first, having given up America and Norway to other people. Yeah. They wanted to be first to both poles in the same expedition. So that's what my wife went for, and seven years of work unpaid. Mm. Mean, I mean working every day, every week, every month without pay, working at weekends to make a living in pubs. Mm. We put together 1,900 sponsor companies, a icebreaker, 42-year-old ice-strengthened ship, got a supply plane. We never flew one meter of the 52,000 miles, but the aim was to do the first journey circumpolar around Earth's surface. Yeah. Columbus had been around that way, as a lot of people had, but nobody had ever been that way, and that was the big record at that time. And so that's what we went for, and after a three-year travel, um, we finally completed the first and last ever journey around Earth's surface vertically. Oh, wow. So that okay. took 10 years out of our lives, or 20 since there were two of us, we then moved on with the same team of volunteers, those who were still alive, um, to break world records at unsupported polar travel, north and south, against the Russians, Canadians and Norwegians during the 80s and 90s. 
and in terms of Antarctica, the first unsupported crossing, meaning you carry uh, 500 pounds of kit for 2,000 miles. Um, and we completed the first continental crossing of Antarctica in about 1992. Um, then after that, we moved to sort of various mountains and other types of expedition. In all your travels, what is your favourite place that you have visited or lived in? Well, I was brought up in South Africa and I think that's the most, to use an old word, beautiful places and I, and I like the people. Over the years, the equipment used has changed quite dramatically. How do you feel about modern equipment we have today for expeditions than what you would have used maybe 30, 40 years ago? Yeah. Um, well, I definitely prefer what we have now to what we had in the 70s, 80s, until 1994. In the polar regions, north and south, the, the satellites did not go on. They weren't polar orbiting satellites until 1994. So there was no GPS. So all those expeditions, we had no GPS, we had no sat nav, we had no sat phone. Without sat phones, you had to have heavy, high frequency radios bouncing your signal off the ionosphere, and the ionosphere is constantly changing, so the frequency you use is constantly changing. So the antenna, which isn't, you don't change the end like you think, change the frequency by going like that. Okay. You get out of the tent into the blizzard or whatever, and then wind in the antenna wire, and that is how you change frequency every five minutes because the ionosphere is changing. So it's a pain in the neck. And, and at the end of the day, after hauling for 10 hours, you get hypothermic very quickly. You want to get in the tent, have a cup of coffee, not set up antenna trying to face them towards your wife 3,000 miles away in the, ba in the base camp. Yeah, uh, yeah. You're very unlikely to get voice through, it's, so Morse code has to be very... Um, I mean, my wife was 25 words a minute, sort of thing, and um, mm. her frequency prediction, luckily, was very, very good, mm. almost instinctive, better than Marconi. Mm. And um, so, yeah, she was pretty good. But now, you go into the tent, switch the cooker on, have a cup of coffee, press your sat phone and you're straight through. So, I mean, the difference is huge. Yeah, it's incredible. Uh, that, that's for whoever the radio communicator would be in the tent. Um, in terms of the navigator, we always used the sun and your watch mm. for 2,000 miles without a feature, that, that within a degree of accuracy, um, which was used by Captain Scott and Shackleton and presumably lots of people before that, so it hadn't changed, but it did change in 1994, by which time we'd done most of our expeditions anyway. Um, and that, on those expeditions when we began to use uh, GPS, again, you go into the tent um, and you work out where you are instead of what I used to have to do, which was to use a sextant or a theodolite Theodolite, the lightest one we ever had, the built T2, was 16 pounds in weight. Wow. Whereas a um, sat nav, you put it in your pocket and you keep it warm and mm. just press the buttons. It's, it's yeah. a big difference. Yeah. Mm. I can imagine on top of all the other weight you have to carry, that's, you know. And the time like, spent, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. For people who are thinking about going travelling or starting their own expedition, what would your advice be? In the, if they're lucky enough to be Brits, then they host the world's nerve centre for exploration, which is called the Royal Geographical Society. It's in London near the Albert Hall. And it's not, I don't know the exact annual cost, probably under £100 membership. And if people use date agencies to find their wives, then this is to find the ideal expedition, or if they want to lead an expedition and they want a radio operator or a camera person or a cook, you know, they, they've got it all laid out if they, have, um, if they are members of the Royal Geographical Society. Fantastic. Plus, yeah. almost any expedition anywhere by Europeans will have been logged and reported on um, 
at the time of the year when it's best. So a river in Nepal, the roughest river in the world, if somebody wants to go on a, a, an expedition there, they'll learn not to do it in June when there's high water over the rocks. I think details like that save an awful lot of time and trouble learning from other people's mistakes. The Guinness Book of World Records accolade for the greatest living adventurer. How do you feel about that? The Guinness Book of Records, one year, 1984, um, had a thing called the World Hall of Fame and they chose certain categories and they did it on the greatest number of records. So that year, um, the world's greatest musician was in the Guinness Book of Records, um, McCartney, Paul McCartney, because he'd sold more records worldwide than anyone else. I had the greatest number of geographical records that year. So when I got told that I had the greatest number of records, I was happy because it wasn't a Norwegian. <laughs> really. And just for those people that don't know, could you Tell us a bit more about the frostbite story. One of the rules was never take anybody who's got frostbite damage or spectacles or things like that. And um, so when I got frostbite, you know, I had to sort of break that rule. Oh, yeah. um, like when I had spectacles, I sort of had to lose that rule. But um, it was in the Arctic, not the Antarctic. Um, and if my expedition colleague, Dr. Stroud from Southampton, if he'd been with me, which normally he would have been, I wouldn't have had a problem because whenever I fell through the ice on Arctic expeditions, he hauled me out. Whenever he fell in, I hauled him out. Hauling out is very difficult, you know, to, to get out. You've got heavy clothes on, you, um, but you need someone else. And in Antarctica, when I fall into a crevasse, he'll haul me out. Two people, Good. One person not good at all, but the Norwegians had done that particular journey too. So what was left was to do it solo. Mm. So I was by myself and it was in the dark, it was minus 48. I'd cut a long story short, I ended up with a, a tent fire yeah. uh, with my lips all cut about because I had no feeling in one hand. So I had to use my mouth for the cooker. Oh, oh, yeah. You need two hands and um, yeah. it, of course metal. And uh, so I got too much petrol in, yeah. got rid of it, lit it, you know, tent fire, um, blood, fire, you know, frostbite in one hand. Anyway, I, I did survive and eventually got back to Montreal in a hospital, a hyperbaric chamber, which is what they do. And a, a surgeon, Frostbite Canada, a good place to get frostbite. PPP was the insurance. They said, no, you, uh, we will only pay for your operation, your amputations in the UK where there aren't, you know, like frostbite experts. So I'd come back to the UK where they found a finger expert at Burns. Burns are meant to be like frostbite in terms of repair, whether that's true or not. And this bloke in Bristol said, well, he wasn't prepared to amputate for five months after the damage because you, you, walk, you can see how much is missing, right? Well, that bit, well, they were here, stuck on dead, and for five months, every time you touch something with a dead bit, it's agony. Okay. And I, I, according to my wife, became very irritable. Um, and at night, of course, you can't not touch things. Yeah. And um, so she, my wife was uh, bred cattle and their hooves cut and all the rest of it, so she thought the same thing. Um, why not? So we bought a Black & Decker, and a sort of funny thing called a micro saw mm. and uh, she bought me cups of tea and I, I gradually went through them. The, the thumb took two days because you wow. sort of turn it round and do a bit and turn it round and do yeah, a bit yeah. and the big bone in the middle and um, so they then looked sort of, <laughs> they looked flat and um, I actually kept the finger ends because I'd had them you know, for a long time. Mm. And, uh, it worked very well and the physiotherapist in Bristol said I'd done a good job. The surgeon wasn't very happy yeah. and um, then after five months I had proper amputations. The reason they wait is because in between the dead and the live there's a semi-traumatized bit okay. and that is going to form the new flaps okay. so it has five months to get yeah. strong. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming to see us today, it's been fascinating. Yeah.
Cheers. Are we having a show you guys on tonight? <laughs> no. Pretty good.